The borders between Utrecht and Amsterdam are becoming increasingly blurred, with the aim of neutralizing their common rivals. The fearsome Rido Antahi doesn't hesitate to join forces with the Amsterdam organization led by Rico the Chilean, an alliance that would have been facilitated through the intermediary of Noffel, who has an extensive network of contacts. Another thing, sir. You also have to meet Rico. He's also like us, Bola. According to the prosecution, this message is the origin of the formation of a criminal trio that operates like a true brotherhood or family. Rico is considered one of the most important players in the Amsterdam underworld. At the age of eight, he settles in the northern district of the city, where he grows up mastering both Dutch and Spanish, a language skill that opens many doors for him in the drug trade. Unfortunately, around the age of 25, due to a lack of caution, he finds himself facing undercover agents in a major coke case in Germany, resulting in an 11-year sentence, of which only six are actually served. Prison allows him to further strengthen his ties with the crime bosses, and he will later visit some of them behind bars. As is often the case with major criminals in Amsterdam, the police keep a close eye on them, waiting for the opportune moment to arrest them in case of any slip-ups. During one such observation in 2011, Rico, accompanied by others, nervously looks around while leaving bags in front of a house he uses in Beethovenstraat. The investigators take the risk and arrest him with 30,000 euros in his possession. However, the money laundering charges do not stick and he is ultimately acquitted. Subsequently, Rico disappears from the police radar and spends more and more time abroad, especially in Spain and South America, while everything is set up to expand the drug trafficking operations. It is important to remember that during this time, the Mokro War is raging in the streets of Amsterdam, pitting two rival groups, one led by Gwinnett Martha against the other by Hus, resulting in a series of liquidations. Rico plays a central role behind the scenes, aligning himself with his friend Gwinnett in this war, but their collaboration is short-lived. Shortly after, in May 2014, Gwinnett's group leader himself is eliminated, marking a turning point in the conflict. The heir of Gwinnett then joins Rico's organization, seeking revenge while attempting to take control of the coke supply chain. A few months later, an influential figure in the underworld, Samir, alias Scarface, is in a business meeting with Noffel, among others from Rico's circle, at a restaurant in southern Spain when he is mercilessly eliminated. Rico's name is frequently mentioned as the mastermind behind this operation, organized with the intention of seizing power in the underworld. This information corroborates that obtained by the criminal intelligence team, the TCI, even though it is not considered irrefutable evidence. What is clear, however, is that the relationships within the criminal underworld are disrupted at the end of 2014, heralding the arrival of a new underground war. At stake is power in the drug trade, with one side being the group around Rico and the other being the heirs of Scarface, particularly his brother Karim, alias Taxi, who is seeking refuge in Dubai. To win this war, forming alliances is essential, especially when different factions have common enemies. Noffel, leveraging his contacts, is said to have played a key role in connecting Ridouan from Utrecht with Rico from Amsterdam. Both groups, in close coordination, decided who would be responsible for what, which targets to eliminate, and how to execute each action all while maintaining constant communication during the course of each operation. Furthermore, 
According to a PGP communication allegedly linked to Ridwan, the importance of staying constantly vigilant against rivals is emphasized to his own group. My sons, I'm going to let this fuck Karim and Scar's son go to sleep in Dubai. Be careful. He would also have asked one of his soldiers to gather more information about Karim. From what I hear in the corridors, it's Scar's little brother, Karim. I know he spends a lot of time in Dubai, and sometimes he goes to Barcelona, but I don't know when, brother. This little brother of Scar is always on high alert. This brother of Scar never comes to the Netherlands. I never hear anything about him, brother. From messages in September 2015, it appears necessary to eliminate rivals by invoking self-defense. The messages continue with the presence of an important lieutenant, Dennis G, also known as Rasta. They need to be removed, quickly Rasta. They have a lot of money and have put a big bounty on our heads. Okay, so you should indeed declare war, but money and balls are two different things. You and Noffel have huge balls, while these idiots are just junkies. They'll eventually understand. They really think that money will save them? Okay, so let's go. Open war. Yeah, exactly. Kill everyone who works with Karim. Everyone. The public prosecutor presumes that the threat from rival factions revolving around Scarface's circle was the reason why Ridoan joined forces with Noffel and Rico from Amsterdam. Moreover, during the same period, Ridoan reportedly warned his henchman, Mao, that it's really war and they need to eliminate those who financially contribute to it, including Karim, as well as Danny Kay, who is part of the old generation. In October 2015, a report from the TCI already mentions a threat to Rico's life, and messages suggest that a contract worth 350,000 euros has been placed on his head. What is particularly remarkable is that Rico is on the list of visitors to the prison, visiting Danny in 2006, which once again demonstrates that former companions can one day become perfect rivals. Mustafa, alias Moose, is also an important member of Scarface's heirs, making him a prime target for the trio, and especially for Ridwan, due to a personal matter linking them. It is crucial to emphasize at this stage that although the two organizations have closely collaborated in the domain of liquidations, each of them pursues their own activities independently. A concrete example is Rico's role as the leader of three distinct branches. One is dedicated to liquidations, another focuses on drug trafficking, and the last one specializes in money laundering. It is in the latter that tens of millions of euros are believed to have been laundered thanks to a unit led by an important team of loyalists, including two particularly significant Chilean coordinators, Carlos and Leonardo. The Orionis investigation begins following information received by the police in December 2015 indicating that Rico ordered former Yugoslav soldiers to carry out several liquidations, including that of Karim. However, the information provided by TCI could not be sufficiently substantiated to confirm the intelligence. Nevertheless, during the investigation, a Volvo S60 was observed several times carrying out very suspicious journeys, often driven by Isam B an individual known to the authorities as an essential member of Rico's team. Their connection was specifically revealed on October the 11th, 2015, when Isam booked a room at the Van der Valk Hotel in Brooklyn, where several forgotten suitcases were discovered and subsequently examined by detectives, one of which contained an iPad associated with Rico's email address. Shortly after, on January the 10th, 2016, observations revealed an unknown individual getting into the same Volvo with Isam on board, 
only to drop off a large backpack before leaving. These circumstances heightened suspicions and led to the installation of a tracker and microphone in the vehicle in question, with the aim of gathering more information about possible criminal activities. The data from the tracker revealed that Issam regularly visited a company called Jumping Fun in Amsterdam, which is now bankrupt, owned by Rico's sister and his brother-in-law. Intercepted conversations suggested that the individuals referred to this company as The Office. Shortly after, in July 2016, the police began conducting searches directly related to Rico and this business. During the search at the so-called office, detectives found barrels in one of the warehouses, along with a plastic bag containing cocaine residue. A scale was also discovered in a safe, as well as a hidden compartment, but nothing particularly intriguing. In April 2016, Rico's sister left the Netherlands with her children, and according to a telephone conversation she had with her mother, it was clear that she attributed the problems she had been facing directly to Rico and had difficult times because of him. Although the prosecution concluded that this office functioned as a drug storage location, this could not be established with certainty in court. Additional police operations were also conducted in various places. During a raid in one of the apartments, the police discovered nearly 1.5 million euros in 500 euro bills, partly concealed in a box with the inscription Louis Vuitton. Financial notebooks were also found in residences linked to Carlos and Leonardo, with the contents appearing almost identical. It was found that over 10 million euros had been converted during the period mentioned in the photo, a sum that was likely generated from drug trade, according to judicial authorities. It is particularly noteworthy that in the same street, Beethovenstraat, where Rico had been apprehended with a considerable amount of money in 2011, he secretly continues to own an apartment. Although Leonardo is officially designated as the tenant and pays the rent and charges, he is not the true user of the apartment. It appears that Rico resides in this apartment, making it his primary residence. This is confirmed by the presence of photos of him and his girlfriend hanging on the walls of the rooms, as well as the discovery of hard drives containing Rico's vacation memories. It is remarkable to note that despite not having officially declared income in the Netherlands since 2011, Rico leads a luxurious life. He uses various tax optimization structures to avoid appearing as the owner on paper. This also applies to his collection of exclusive and expensive cars. During a search at the business premises of a company referred to as X1, for confidentiality reasons, a file containing information about a fleet of vehicles was discovered. According to Europol, all these vehicles are registered under the name of another German company, referred to as X2. Additionally, a copy of Rico's passport was found. Judicial authorities state that the public prices of these cars are beyond the reach of most citizens. The close cooperation between the two owners of companies X1 and X2 makes them crucial links in the money laundering related to the vehicles that have been repeatedly used by Rico's associates. For example, during one of Issam's many visits to the Van der Valk Hotel, surveillance camera footage showed him in one of the Mercedes cars on the list. Furthermore, on November the 23rd, 2015, Rico allegedly organized the transportation of one of the Mercedes cars to Chile using the services of X1 Company. The car was loaded onto a ship bound for Chile from Rotterdam. The ongoing investigation in Chile revealed that Rico's father was indeed using this vehicle, which was then equipped with a Chilean license plate placed over the German one. 
Furthermore, a witness who worked within the X1 company stated that Rico was most likely the true owner of the vehicles, based on the description provided. He is about 35 to 40 years old, of South American descent, and has a sporty appearance. Regardless, the justice system will have enough evidence to incriminate Rico and make this branch of money laundering the first piece of the puzzle that will lead to his downfall. However, it will still take a considerable amount of time before this materializes. In the drug trade, Rico actively handles the supply directly from the source, thanks to his strong connections in Latin America. For different stages of the logistics chain, he collaborates closely with other key players in the underworld. For instance, he entrusts the responsibility of the shipping line, i.e. transportation, to individuals like Rafael Imperiale. The latter is a major figure associated with the Camorra Mafia and, according to officers' information, both he and Rico are involved in numerous operations together. These elements align with the encrypted messages exchanged between the two individuals, where they use coded terms such as telephones. In these exchanges, they allude to the smell of the phones while discussing prices of 22 and 24. According to the prosecution's information, this coded language is associated with coke, which was priced at around 22,000 to 24,000 euros per kilo at the time. Delving deeper into Rico's group financial records, we discover considerable sums allocated for expenses labelled as telephones. However, it seems highly improbable that such colossal amounts are genuinely meant for purchasing encrypted phones, especially considering the relatively short periods involved. Rico's role in shipping operations is further highlighted in September 2015, when inside information surfaces about a major delivery scheduled for Rotterdam on behalf of Rico. The details indicate that the cargo is expected to arrive around the 24th or 25th of September. As it turns out, on the 27th of September, exactly as mentioned in the tip, a quantity of 440 kilograms of coke was discovered at the specified location. There is no doubt that Rico operates in the big leagues, especially when investigators get hold of his phone and discover a video featuring him alongside Raphael and Daniel Kinahan of the Irish cartel. The three are seen visiting an apartment in Dubai. This emirate, renowned for its global reputation for security, also becomes the playground for Rico's liquidation branch, where his friend Raphael plays a crucial role, not only in transportation, but also in a mission to eliminate their rival, Karim. The mission has been ongoing since the spring of 2016. Raphael Imperiale aims to trap Karim at the Tiara residence in Dubai. Rico is informed of the situation on site by Imperiale himself with his broken English, and then relays the message to Noffel. Hermano, this is Tiara residence on Palm Junera. Please, if you send somebody, make sure he has a very, very clean face, because they look a lot around them. Most of the time, it is from 5pm, but sometimes also later. After the gym, they go eat something at the bar, and they sit always inside. It's where Karim always goes to exercise, bro. Can you send this to the team? A new message arrives from Imperiale. Hermano, the place I told you last time is sure. He is going out there four times a week, but I don't know where exactly, because there are many different places here, so it can be difficult to track him, because it can often vary. I think the gym is the best way, the easiest option to try. If it doesn't work, then I will make a meeting with him, and I will send you a photo. This rat, he'll be knocked out immediately, brother. And these bastards can't always be so lucky. Trust these taxes, bro. 
In this context, taxis refers to a team of observers responsible for meticulously mapping Karim's route. Moreover, one of the important coordinators from Rico's team arrives in Dubai on April the 5th and books a hotel from April the 6th to April the 20th, informing Nofal about it. Brother, I am in Dubai. I have checked in at the hotel. Still no news about those taxis? No, brother. We will meet them tonight at 10 o'clock, local time, and then have dinner with them. Do you want us to start working here? Surveying the neighbourhoods? JBR, Palm and the hills? We can begin with that. Yes, please, brother. We must find him without fail. There's a party coming up where he will likely be present. You will have to attend later. For now, let's focus on careful observation on site and make sure the taxis are prepared, as it is crucial. Understood, brother. I will start working here right away. We'll be accompanied by the taxi guys tonight. If we know the location of the party in advance, and I can do some observation beforehand. On the day of the party, I'll go in and will remain in the car, ready to follow him as soon as he leaves the party. I'll join them 15 minutes later to continue following him. Brother, I just finished having dinner with the taxi drivers. They still haven't spotted the car. They are vigilant. They also suggested another option, on the internet, using the license plate number. You can check for fines and vehicle details. If this person frequently receives fines on a certain route, we will at least know which route and at what time he commits them. Maybe I can discover a pattern if there's a history of fines for this car. Can I check this license plate on the internet, brother? The website belongs to the government and is also used to pay tax fines, etc. Exactly. He explains to Noffel that they are trying to identify Karim's likely routine route, but it's challenging to keep him under constant surveillance. He wonders if they can check his license plate online and link it to fines and other publicly available information on the government website. In any case, they continue their observations in various neighbourhoods of the city. Brother, is a summary of the day. From 6 to 9 this morning, we monitored Albertine residence and Marina Boulevard. Marina Boulevard is the presumed place where this person goes jogging every morning. And I took turns to watch and walk in the area, but we didn't see him. After 9, it gets too hot for sports or running. We also didn't spot any of the mentioned cars at Albertine. Then, we drove around the palm, but we didn't make any progress. Tonight, we'll go to the hills, brother. We'll keep focusing daily on JBR, Palm, and the hills. More than a week later, Rico engages in a conversation with Rafael Imperial, who appears to be getting closer and closer to Karim. We're looking, and please, we have to know all from him, please. Where will you meet him, hermano? Somewhere we can follow him? Hermano, I understand your idea already. You want to take him here. It is difficult, but not impossible. Hermano, I gotta lay it out for you. Out of respect, you know. I ain't short on weapons and all that. But here's the deal. Our pal wants to hang around there, so I'm thinking of handling things with a knife. My ninja crew is locked and loaded, and the second we spot this guy, we'll handle the situation. But look, I ain't about dragging you into this mess. So if you happen to bump into him within a hundred meters, we'll go for the stabbing option. But be aware, there could be consequences. The head is doing overtime to catch him. Once, we clocked him at a mall, rolling up in a black Bentley. But the ninja showed, poof, he was gone. Rico makes it clear that using firearms in Dubai is not a wise idea, as it would attract too much attention. Moreover, one of the team members wants to stay in Dubai and live there. So leaving any evidence after the mission is not an option at all. He also emphasizes that if Karim is eliminated after meeting with Imperiale, all suspicions will be directed towards him as an accomplice. Hi, Hermano. I spoke with Karim today. I will meet him on Wednesday. It is not surprising to encounter Karim, as Imperiale has business relations with many individuals in the milieu. Therefore, there should be no suspicion about his involvement in Rico's team's plan. However, as time goes on, 
problems seemed to accumulate for Imperiale, which could have serious consequences for him. You've been hanging around there for way too long. That's just gonna make the issue blow up even more. All right, in that case, we're going all in with the knife option. No doubt about it. You better stash those guns away, so we don't end up tangled in a mess. We've got a duo of ninjas on the scene. They're primed to move on the moment we lay eyes on him. One's taking care of business, while the other's keeping an eye out to make sure it all goes down without a hitch. These guys are the real deal. They know the drill, and everything's been squared away, so no need to stress. This dog was present at the Cavalry Club with the Colombian guys. Although, we were also present. The ninja couldn't gain access due to an altercation he had with someone earlier that day. This dog was incredibly lucky. Our operative managed to take photographs from inside. We need to know where he will be in advance. Whether he's at a mall, restaurant or terrace. Once we pinpoint his location, our team will move in and conclude the situation. In one of those phones seized later at Rico's place, a photo was discovered showing a person who bears a striking resemblance to Karim. The photo appears to have been taken quickly, with a dark background, suggesting a nighttime environment, possibly a nightclub. All right, things are sort of getting back to how they used to be. You'll see. This guy is all paranoid and scared as hell. And you know what? It's costing him big time. He's losing jobs left and right. Other Colombians aren't down to work with the same energy anymore. They're talking about losses like 1,950 kilos, 3,000 kilos, 5,000 kilos, 3,700 kilos, all in a blink. And they're pointing fingers at his issues as the cause. See, he's so paranoid he's throwing money around trying to get me, but others are just messing with his head and he throws all his money for that. So there's no chance things will chill if he's still roaming around, throwing money to fuel war like a bitch and just hiding out there. Karim, who inherited a vast financial empire from his brother Scarface, once considered one of the wealthiest drug kingpins in the Netherlands, seems to be paying a high price for waging a war against the entourage of Rico and Ridwan. All of this is detrimental to their business, as paranoia keeps growing, leading to making poor decisions. This results in financial losses for Colombian suppliers, who used to work with Scarface and now maintain relations with his heirs, that is, Karim's entourage. In the world of crime, connections are tight, and it can happen that different teams share the same suppliers in Latin America, as cartels are primarily motivated by money and do not consider local issues, meaning the client side. However, problems can arise when significant quantities of drugs, as mentioned in the message alluding to the lost shipments of coke in thousands of kilograms, are compromised. This can have detrimental consequences for the entire criminal network, and that's why dealing with Karim quickly becomes necessary. We can put a GPS on his car, so we will know where he lives. The house can be also an option. Let me tell you why. For most of the buildings in Dubai, if you go through the garage and take emergency stairs, there is no cameras, so the job can be done in a very clean way. Just follow him when he goes back home. Then the ninja goes through the emergency stairs and waits for him when he comes out from the elevator on his floor. Perfecto. That's the best place. He will be relaxing there. We can even send a girl his way. He'll think she's all into him, you know, like a hooker. We'll sneak a GPS onto her phone and we'll have all the info we need. Ultimately, it seems that the mission is likely to fail as the ninjas are no longer able to locate Karim. However, it should be noted that Karim is just one target among a long list of individuals that the organizations of Ridoan and Rico are seeking to eliminate. This absurd situation has led to heated debates between the two camps, each claiming to have the best strategy to succeed in the mission. Brother, we will need to go to Colombia. A cousin of Karim, this snake is going there, and we can catch him. I think it's Jalal. We can take everything he has from him. We will make him hand over the merchandise. 
around 500 kilos, and we will take them from him. Then he will be gone, brother. Is that good? Let Sir also help us in this matter, and we will share the money with him. Yes, start, brother. But I'm not sure we should involve Sir in this one, because some time ago I also told him that Jalal had to disappear. He knew everything about him back then, but he wasn't very favourable to the idea. He said he had nothing against him, but against the other brother. So I think we should take care of it ourselves. But I can ask him if you want, Hermano. The potential target will have been Jalal El A, a member of Karim's entourage. The message exchanges between Nofel and Rico suggest that Rico was considering tricking and eliminating Jalal also involving Ridwan in the plan. However, in their last conversation, Nofel mentions that Ridwan would not be in favor of getting rid of Jalal. Therefore, it is best to keep Ridwan out of this matter. Very well. Don't do it. We'll take care of it ourselves. But let go there first, as we plan to kidnap him there. We need to know everything about him beforehand. However, only a month later, it appears that Jalal is on the list shared by both teams, as evidenced by the discussions exchanged via PGP, which have been linked to Rico and Ridwan and studied by the judicial authorities. Sir, this is Jalal. We can take him down in France. The shooter is already ready, and we'll directly pay the driver. This son of a is going to my city of Tetuan, sir. Tomorrow it will be taken care of. All the informed shooters will deal with him. This dirty rat. Let's open his mouth, hermano, sir. Ah, oh, sir, our brother and I have already told you. These boys are ready, sir. Don't do it like this, please. Please. This dirty rat. Let me handle the situation. These boys are already ready, sir. The plan suggested by Rico to capture Jalal in France is not considered the best option by Ridouan. According to him, it would be preferable to trap him in Morocco, where a team is ready to eliminate him and then escape to Spain using a Zodiac. The shooters, everything is ready. When Jalal is in Tetuan, it's ready. Great news, sir. This is excellent news. Although the missions take longer than expected to set up, and the PGP communication available to the court represents only the visible tip of the iceberg, it is clear according to the justice that in Rico's liquidation branch, he has partnered with the Utrecht group, led by Ridouan, to create a joint list of rivals. While some are fortunate enough to escape their grip and schemes, others are inevitably swept away like domino pieces in a whirlwind.